So um, I would like to welcome everybody uh, who joined on our first ever um, online meetup that we ever hosted uh, in partnership with our dear friends from Tartal. Uh, today's event is going to be um, oriented mostly towards uh, Blazor front-end framework, the new front-end framework that was developed by the uh, .NET team, which is supposed to be very good. And there's all sorts of uh, hypes around it. So we'll see from uh, Mario if that hype is uh, basically justified. Uh, second part of the meetup, because what we usually have when we organize meetups is uh, there's the uh, presentation, and then, the, then there's the um, QA session or a little mingling session afterwards, which we cannot obviously do when we're hosting an online meetup. So I'm going to do a little talk with Mario regarding um, things mostly related to Blazor, but some other things related to the in general um, ecosystem of front end frameworks. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, that you would like to ask Mario, either related to something that he said during his talk or something related to uh, TopTal, his uh, haircut, uh, his headphones or whatever, you have a section in Zoom called Q&A where you can post a question and then I'll, I'll ask him. A um, couple of small things about the today's organizers because this is kind of a regional event because I saw in the, in the list we have a couple of people from Zagreb, from Belgrade, from Niche, which is uh, quite nice. So um, Ters House uh, is a co-working space that I co-founded a couple of months ago. And um, we're trying really hard to be a very community-oriented uh, co-working space. So we do all kinds of uh, events where we try to engage uh, a community of developers, designers, uh, people from marketing to kind of come, come together and do some cool stuff. And in partnership with TopTal, uh, this is our second uh, meetup that we're hosting with them. Uh, we have a very good collaboration and I hope uh, basically that in the future it's going to work the same. Next time, hopefully, we'll see each other in person. Um, I wouldn't like to talk too much about uh, Tesla's and all those things because I think what most people came here to see and learn something new about, uh, learn something new is the, uh, the Blazor framework. So I'm going to hand over the uh, poor web camera and uh, a bad quality microphone to Mario and uh, let's see what the hype is all about regarding the, the new Blazor framework. Mario, please. Thank you, Nermin. So I also have uh, a web camera and a Bluetooth microphone. I hope everybody hears me. If not, feel free to shout in the chat, though at this point I'm not 100% sure uh, uh, how to fix it. So. We can take it from there. So for everybody, for everybody who doesn't know, I'm Mario Muzzalo, nice to meet you all. And thank you, Nermin, for having me for this talk. Thanks to the Pers House team. Um, I would much rather that I was actually in Sarajevo doing this talk live, but eh, this will have to do for now. So uh, today I'd like to talk to you all about Blazor. Uh, as then said, Blazor is a new uh, new cool thing to build interactive UIs in C Sharp and interactive web apps. But uh, the goal is that they are trying to use it to sort of get across all stacks, all, all uh, platforms, everywhere, everything. And basically, they are trying to make it a one ring to rule them all. One ring to rule front end, back end, mobile, uh, Linux, iOS, everything. So today we're going to see what Blazor can do, what Blazor can't do, and if Blazor can indeed become such universal technology. Okay, but before Blazor, let's talk about me, because of course the most important thing is to talk about me. So uh, I am a software engineer. I have graduated from University of Zagreb at the Faculty of Computer Science, and for the last 12, let's say, years. I've been doing software development, uh, full stack. On the back end, I focus on Microsoft technologies, as you could have figured. While on the front end, of course, is JavaScript, and I prefer uh, Angular. In my career, I've worked for several companies. I'd just like to point them out. One is Lemux. Lemux is a company from Croatia, which is actually one of the world's leaders in uh, tourism and tour operator softwares. They really have an amazing solution. And if you are looking for work, if you are willing to relocate to Zagreb, Lemux is an amazing company delivering a great solution, great team of people. I honestly uh, 
suggest looking it up. Then uh, I decided to go a little bit on my own, so I started working for TopTel. Uh, TopTel, as you know, is an elite network of experts that get connected to different clients in order to help them solve their problems. And uh, in TopTel, I firstly work as a programmer working on client projects, and then at one point I joined the core team where I worked as a director of engineering in charge of connecting clients to handpick developers based on clients' needs as well as uh, head of the screening team. The screening team is a team that basically tests all of the developers before they get in because only top 3% can actually get in. So I was leading that team. Uh, a couple of years ago, I quit TopTal, uh, quit TopTal's core team and moved on to working my own company called Intelligence. Intelligence is basically a uh, custom software uh, development company developing custom web applications mainly in Microsoft Stack and Angular. And uh, in the last couple of years, I am a CTO at a company called PKTOR. PKTOR is a company that researches customer experience for their enterprise clients. If you want to contact me for any reason whatsoever, you can find my contact details uh, on the screen. And enough about me, finally. So today, uh, as we said, we're going to talk about Blazor. And Blazor helps you build uh, rich uh, UI interactive web apps using C Sharp and primarily C Sharp. I'm not going to say only C Sharp because of reasons, but primarily C Sharp. So before uh, uh, actually getting into what Blazor is and how it works, I'd like to discuss a little bit how we got to where we are. So Microsoft first developed .NET Core. .NET Core is, was the logical conclusion to .NET Frameworks. So .NET Frameworks uh, stopped at one point and Microsoft switched to .NET Core. .NET Core is better. They switched the whole engine behind and they uh, found a way to make it work on, to be self-hosted and to work on all platforms. So .NET Core can normally run on, for example, Linux and, and things like that. And this was a huge uh, uh, change from the technical side. However, the concepts, uh, building MVC applications and things like that remain the same. .NET Core, though, is open source. And that was a direction that Microsoft took where it wants to put all, all of it, or at least most of it, technology uh, open source which had an awesome impact with the community because the community was really uh, uh, contributing, working, throwing issues and so on. So uh, uh, it was a great step and I think the community really came alive. As Microsoft was figuring that they need to open their uh, tech stack up in order to get as much developers as possible, they are also now looking uh, at .NET standard. So. To take a step back, uh, .NET Core is meant to work in hosting environments where it can. However, they're now looking, the goal of the team is to put .NET everywhere. And in order to put .NET everywhere, they have invented what we call a .NET standard. It's a reduced sub subset of APIs, but that can really work everywhere. So the .NET standard libraries can be used inside .NET Core projects, but also .NET Framework projects, but also Xamarin projects, and so on. So the idea is to get a, get a one platform that can work everywhere and get one set of APIs that can literally be ported everywhere. On another end, uh, Microsoft has Razor. And Razor is basically, um, Razor allows you to write views using C sharp code. So, for example, if you have a template where something repeats itself, you can use the C sharp syntax of a for each statement or a for loop or whatever to get that thing rolling. And there are, of course, uh, additional stuff. This is like a basic simplification, but Razor allows you to write uh, C sharp code to define your views. And Razor was used to write views in MVC applications primarily. Uh, at some moments, it was clumsy. So if you're building just an application where uh, you have a form on one form on one page and everything gets submitted and so on, then Razor was a perfect solution. As it got 
as the world got uh, to a place where everybody requires applications that are rich in UI, that have dynamic interactions, that have Ajax and everything, Razor on its own and views were clumsy and you always needed to use some JavaScript. So in order to actually uh, uh, deliver uh, great quality rich applications, I myself opted never to use uh, uh, DMVC with the views in, in uh, .NET, but I would use .NET Core as a backbone for the API and I would use Angular to build rich front-end applications. And uh, a lot of people did that, and that's where JavaScript also comes in because everybody was doing backend on the API, but the only way you could get the rich UIs was through JavaScript and different frameworks that it was using. Until at one point, uh, WebAssembly was created. So WebAssembly is binary native code that can be executed directly in the browser. So what does that mean? Uh, for those of you who are older, uh, or for those of you who went to computer science classes, you know that there is assembler. And assemblers are basically sets of zeros and one that are executed directly at the processor level. And if you could actually code in assembler, that would give you most options and that would give you fastest and optimal code. On the other hand, nobody can actually do that because writing anything more complex in zeros and ones would take forever. Similar thing is with WebAssembly. So WebAssembly compiles directly into binary instructions, not into JavaScript, and those binary instructions are executed directly in uh, the browser. And today it's supported by uh, most of the browsers or by all of the browsers. And they have actually done comparisons between uh, programs that were written in JavaScript and programs that were written in WebAssembly. And WebAssembly actually produces uh, better, has better performance, produces better speed, which is awesome. And uh, where they have, where, where people are finding great use for it currently is either in high computations that they're trying to throw directly at the browser, or even in gaming industries where they're trying to like make uh, uh, walk into 3D, 3D spaces and so on in the browser. So WebAssembly is great. However, as WebAssembly is a, a set of binaries, that means that you can technically compile pretty much everything into WebAssembly. And uh, people have started building uh, compilers. I believe, and this may be wrong, but I believe Rust was first that had a compiler that compiles Rust code directly into WebAssembly. Uh, I believe C++ soon followed, then Python. And at one point, the Microsoft team was starting to think, okay, if they can do it, let's see if we can do it. So that's, uh, uh, that's one idea how Blazor got created. On the other hand, as we said, Razor uh, view templates were kind of clumsy. And Microsoft was thinking, okay, it's kind of clumsy. What would happen if we open the socket connection and once the page is opened, we could actually transfer all traffic to sockets. So the people who were uh, developing Razor components were developing from that direction. Other teams were developing, okay, let's compile uh, uh, .NET to WebAssembly. And if you really want to learn more about the internals of WebAssembly, for example, Dino has a great question if WebAssembly can be decompiled or reverse engineered, and uh, if it's dangerous that the users will get your code. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. I have not, not tried. I would say it would be really, really tricky from the top of my head. Uh, we can discuss that a little bit later on in the QA section. Uh, but regarding WebAssembly, if you really want to see how it works and uh, all the insides and outsides, there is a great talk given by Kirill Cherkashin, What's Inside WebAssembly. He gave it at the Armada JS conference at Novi Sad uh, last year, where I had the privilege to be, and it was a great conference. Thanks for all the thanks to all the organizers. And the guy actually had a talk where he was doing live coding in WebAssembly uh, uh, for 45 minutes and it was just really crazy. I loved it. 
So basically, uh, as I said, the goal of the team that figured out that they could compile .NET into WebAssembly was to actually get code written in Razor into WebAssembly and directly into the browser. And that's sort of where it all came together. So you have uh, Razor inside browser, browser, Razor, browser, Razor. By combining those two, they created Blazor. That's how it turned out. And as I mentioned, uh, they created Blazor. One team was working on getting uh, everything to run in the browser, while the other team was getting on getting more rich Razor components. And at one point, they really just called them Razor components, even though they were enriched with uh, socket connections. And then in the end, they said, OK, this is doing Razor components, and it's enriching UI, and it's allowing building better uh, uh, applications within the browser. Let's call all of it Blazor, which is uh, uh, easy enough, and it is great for marketing, and it is beautiful because you can just uh, advertise the new technology Blazor. However, it does cause a little bit of confusion. So there are two Blazors. There is what we call Blazor server side and Blazor client side or Blazor WebAssembly, depending how you want to call it. So the Blazor server side is a concept where everything is run on the server, like a standard web application. Uh, HTMLs are uh, rendered and uh, served at the client from a browser. However, uh, there is a file called blazor.server.js, which is also um, in the in the web page that is opened. That file is uh, automatically opens up a single R connection to the server, and basically everything you do in the browser automatically sends the necessary data to the server. The server processes it in any way that it has to and returns the relevant information back. The JavaScript file then knows, based on that, which DOM it needs to manipulate. So from a user point of view, uh, uh, you get stuff similar to, to uh, two-way binding, but it actually binds directly to the server. And you get cool features, like you can write directly to the database from the pages and stuff like that. We're going to show that in examples. On the other hand, we have Blazor client side. So as we said, one of the teams wanted to actually uh, take all of the .NET Core and put it in the browser so that everything runs, everything compiles into WebAssembly and everything runs in the browser. And they actually did it. So uh, all of the runtime that your application needs gets compiled into DLLs. Those get uh, uh, compiled into WebAssemblies go into the browser and run directly in the browser. So basically, you get a self-hosted single page application running exclusively and directly in the browser. And those are the two uh, uh, main differences. And now, the good thing is that they share a lot. The good thing is that they uh, uh, can easily be switched from one to another if you're doing things right and so on. But we're going to discuss that later on. Uh, a big thing to note is that Blazor server is in version one and is production ready since, I'm going to say November last year, maybe December last year. Don't, don't, uh, uh, please correct me, whoever knows. While uh, the Blazor WebAssembly is not yet production ready, it is still in preview phases, and they expect it to be ready in May, but they expected it to be ready for the last version as well, so I'm not sure if it's going to be ready in May. So now I'd like to show you uh, roughly how some of that looks like. Uh, there is code in uh, GitHub that you can later pick up, and uh, Nermin will later put the link to this uh, presentation somewhere in the chat so that everybody can take the code and, and tell me that it's horrible. But basically, uh, I've created two projects pretty much from the 
um, standalone template that you get when you go into a Visual Studio and click File, New Project. So here at the moment, on the screen in your browser, you see what a sample uh, uh, Blazor WebAssembly application looks like. And pretty much all of this comes uh, from the demo template for scaffolding, except this form, but we can get into that later. What I'd like to do is I'd like to open uh, Chrome DevTools. I'd like to open Chrome DevTools and show you the network how it looks like. So we are now looking at Blazor uh, WebAssembly. When I refresh the page and check uh, the network traffic, I see that it's loading and I see that it loaded a bunch of stuff. So it loaded uh, all the CSS, all the JavaScript, yada, yada, and then it loaded a bunch of DLLs that are, uh, that are there. And as you can see, these are DLLs that pretty much correspond to uh, uh, .NET packages. They're actually .NET uh, standard libraries, and they get compiled into DLLs that can be run into uh, WebAssembly. So the downside of the client-side application is that the load is a little bit slow. You saw a few seconds that it needs to uh, that it needs to load, and also you uh, you get a pretty big uh, uh, amount of data that needs to go down. So as you can see here, we have uh, five megabytes loaded by the page. However, once all of this is loaded. This is now a completely standalone single page application like you would have any application in React, Angular, or uh, um, choose the JavaScript of your choice. Okay. On the other hand, if I switch to server and again do that, and again do that, and again go to the network. So if I refresh the server page, you will see that it loads only a few basic uh, uh, elements that it has, but you'll see that one of them is the famous laser server JS file. And it does this. So what this is, is opening a signal R connection to the server so that any changes that you actually uh, uh, do in the interface will actually go to the server, they will do whatever they need, they will come back, and the Blazor server JS JavaScript will know how to parse it and know how to update the DOM. Okay? So this is the main, main, main concept difference. Even though everything looks the same, these two applications look uh, work pretty differently. And it's important to understand this before we actually go further, so there it is. Now I'm going to talk about how we can do stuff with Blazor, what are the cool stuff we can do, why, what advantages does it bring, and so on. So uh, here are some of the list of the cool features, and on the right side you can see the list of some of my uh, favorite resources for, for learning. There are a few others, but I'll mention that shortly. But let's go into the cool features of Blazor. So the first feature I want to talk about is sharing data models. So whoever uh, uh, was working on a single page application recently that connects to a backend API had the problem that the API needed to make uh, their uh, uh, models, and then you needed to make the same models in, for example, TypeScript so that you could have uh, validation and everything. And that's kind of annoying. And then if you have uh, mobile applications that connect to the same API, they need like a, 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 third, a third set of uh, model files. And these model files are just like defining data models with properties. They, they, they shouldn't be written n uh, x times. So if we take a look at the code, we see that I have a shared project here. 
And the shared project is actually a .NET standard library, a standard class library. And here I would like to point out that it is .NET standard class library, not just .NET core class library. If it were a .NET core class library, it couldn't get compiled and sent down to WebAssembly. So if you want to get class libraries sent down to WebAssembly, use .NET standard. Uh, if I check my models, here I see my user info model. And it's uh, uh, pretty basic, just an example for this, for this talk. But basically it has a first name, last name, and email. And this model in this shared library is used across all of my projects. So my Blazor uh, uh, WebAssembly app, my Blazor server app, they all uh, uh, have a reference to the shared um, to the shared uh, project, and they can all use stuff from that class library. So they can all use the same model, which means if you need to add a property, you can add it in one place. It also means some other stuff, like if you need to add validation, you can add it in one place, and so on and so on, but we'll get there. Okay, so just by creating one shared library and referencing it for multiple projects, you can use same uh, data models. But the cool thing is that it doesn't necessarily stop at data models. So uh, you can actually share code logic. And this code logic is not uh, necessarily something that connects to uh, controller and stuff, but things that do calculations can be reused on the client side and the server side. So here I have a pretty basic example of a service which is like really uh, uh, primitive. It actually gets full name based on user info and a Boolean parameter whether you want first name, last name or last name, first name. And also full name with email where it puts email into brackets. So pretty basic, but I can use this same service in my API project, in my uh, client side application and in my Blazor server application. So it really allows you to uh, structure your code better and to actually reuse more code. All right. So the next thing that happens are components. So uh, component concept is similar like it is in, for example, Angular, and it is actually a, a Razor components are an idea they got from view components and so on. But basically the idea is that you can have one component that can be re reused in multiple places. All right. For example, if you have like, if you're doing a project and you need uh, to have an avatar which has your photo and your name, you would build a component for that and just use it in any page that you need. You could need it in your profile page. You could need it in your, uh, and in the main menu, you could need it at the logout page and so on. So that's the idea. And all these uh, components can work as uh, on their own. They can take input parameters, they can uh, uh, send, they can emit events out and so on. So there are different ways of communicating to, uh, to and from components. Unfortunately, we won't have the time today probably to go into that. Maybe we will. I'll need to check. Uh, but basically, a cool thing is that you can build what we call a Razor component library. So in a similar way, like you would build a class library, which has all your uh, classes that you want to reuse or that you want to share between projects. Here you can actually build what we call a Razor component library, which allows you to build your Razor components that you later want to share between projects. And one example uh, uh, that Dan Roth is giving when he's presenting Blazor is uh, like a slider where you would leave a review by tagging a number of stars. If you make that component uh, uh, 
dumb enough, so that it's not necessarily connected to program logic, you could actually reuse that in any of the projects where you need to leave a rating on anything. So you can take a component like that, put it into a Razor component library, and then reference that library uh, uh, whenever you need. So that's, uh, that's a great thing. And here we have an example. If you can see here, we have the Blazor uh, demo share components. And here I have a user info form component. So user info form component uh, much better. So user uh, info form component basically has the form where we can enter this uh, uh, first name, last name, and email. Okay, and uh, if you see, if we check either the uh, server side Blazor application or the client side Blazor application, they have this user info form. This user info form is actually the component that we're just looking. And regardless whether we are looking at the client side application or the server side application, the component is actually the same. So you can share your components between server side and client side applications, which is kind of cool. All right. Uh, while we're on components, I'd like to touch base on a quick subject. Normally, uh, when you add a component, it has a code block here. I prefer to have my uh, markup in my code in two separate files. I prefer my code behind to be called .razor.cs so that in Visual Studio it kind of nicely uh, uh, nests under the component where it belongs. The only tricky thing is that the code behind needs to inherit the component base. And uh, as the component takes up, ah, as the component takes up this class name, your backend code class needs to have a different name. So usually you put in just base to make sure that it's the base component. Uh, you can read about this naming and placing of components. I have an article on my blog. Uh, I think I put a link somewhere in the presentation or somewhere, or you can just Google it. Uh, so this is a component. And as you can see, this component is, as we said, if you want to reuse it, it shouldn't have a lot of logic. It should uh, be quote unquote dumb. And if you check the Front end is just label and input text, label and input text, label and input text, submit button, edit form, so pretty uh, uh, simple stuff. But it's cool that it can be reused on both uh, front end and back. The next thing that I like, and I love the fact that we invented it, is two-way binding. So here I'm gonna use the word two-way binding even though it's not really, but basically uh, in your component, you can say that I want to bind the value of an input box to some property. And as the box changes property, the object in your memory automatically, automatically changes value, which means that if I do something like this, here it automatically figures out that my name is Mario. If I do something like this, it automatically updates the string. So whenever I change a, a, a value, the two-way binding works uh, automatically. In the same way, it works on the client side. Okay? So that's something that I really love, and this is actually the reason why I started doing Angular, because when I saw the Angular demos and when Angular initially went to started, when it could do that, I was like, wow, I want to use that. So. Uh, uh, I really love the fact that I can get it now in C sharp without any JavaScript or JavaScript libraries or JavaScript tools and so on. So uh, uh, that's one thing that I find important and cool. The next thing that I find important and cool is the validation. So when I was mentioning about shared data models, uh, anybody who's ever worked in C sharp has used data annotations to validate your models, right? And that uh, uh, works fine, that works perfectly. 
However, here we have put the model in the standard .NET standard library, and we are using that library everywhere. I'm reusing it in my API. I am reusing it in my uh, Blazor server side application. I'm reusing it in my Blazor uh, client side application. And in my uh, component that I'm also using, it has uh, one valid submit, which means that when a submit passes through form validation, this method is going to be called. And this is uh, uh, built into already into uh, uh, Blazor. So this will automatically validate against the model that you provided here. If the model is valid, it will trigger this. Uh, it will trigger this uh, method. However, the cool thing is, if you actually go here, if we actually uh, do it on the server. And if we check network, if we click that, and if we check WebSocket, so here we are now actually checking WebSocket traffic. If I click submit, it will send a message. It will send a message back, and it will give me info that the email uh, field is required. So technically, the message went to the server. The server did server-side validation, returned information back, and the information that the email field is required was shown. If I do the same thing on the client side, uh, doop. Ah, doop. If I do the same thing on the client side, if I check uh, all the traffic, if I click submit, nothing happened. So we are now, this is the client side, this is a single page application, and therefore the validation is uh, client side. Again, which is, Kind of awesome. So you just put data annotations, and depending on uh, which Blazor you use, it automatically knows how and where to put validation, which is awesome. Again, I'm using the same thing in my API controller. So basically, the, the API controller is just getting this uh, model. And as it is decorated with the API controller, uh, it will automatically give 401 if the model is invalid in any way. And if you want, uh, I don't have Postman turned on, so you're going to have to believe me on that or download the thing from, from GitHub and try it. If anybody really doubts me, I can do a demo later on. And after you use all of that nice stuff that Blazor already has, and after you start working, you actually hit a real life problem because real life doesn't have mercy towards new technologies. In real life, if you have a project, you have to solve problems. If you have problems, you have to find a solution. And if the technology that you're using doesn't have a solution for those problems, well, that's your problem. So Blazor is still fairly new and Blazor still doesn't have wrappers for all the APIs that JavaScript does or doesn't have a, a connection to everything. And I believe that the Microsoft team is working on this and that they will be uh, putting in more and more and more features. However, at this moment, you still need to, uh, you still need to use JavaScript for something. And as the guys figured, okay, if we say that you cannot use JavaScript, if we strictly prohibit it, people will never adopt the technology and will never be able to solve all the problems. So they built something that's called JavaScript interop. And JavaScript interop works uh, even on a WebAssembly basis. So from WebAssembly native code, you can call JavaScript. From JavaScript, you can call uh, WebAssembly native code. This works in the browser. Microsoft just put a nice uh, a way how to add it to your projects and how to use it. So, uh, if I check, for example, on the client side application, uh, in my index file, I have a pretty basic uh, example alert function, which alerts whatever it gets. Okay, this is pretty standard JavaScript stuff. If I take a look at the page where we have our form, I can see here that uh, 
I am injecting the uh, IJS runtime uh, uh, service. So the JS runtime service is a service that is used to use uh, JavaScript internal. And basically, once you, uh, it is easy to dependency inject it because that's the easiest way to, and that's the only proper way to actually add it to your uh, uh, components, pages, or wherever you need. But basically, once you use dependency injection to get it, you simply call its invoke uh, async method, which gets which function you want to call. And uh, uh, here I'm just passing on the parameters that I wanted to send. So here I wanted to send welcome and my first name. All right. So if I check how that works in an actual, for example, client side application, I'm going to say, no, it's a lot. I'm going to say, uh, oops. come. And if I click submit, bam, alert directly from JavaScript. Of course, you can do much more complex things. This is like the most uh, basic example. And of course, we can do uh, this. You can do regardless whether you're doing uh, uh, client side or server side. Bam. And of course, with that, you can get all of the JavaScript native APIs that already exist. You can combine JavaScript and Blazor. Basically, you can use JavaScript to enhance, uh, uh, to enhance the possibilities of Blazor. Blazor is uh, fully compliant with progressive web apps. So if you want to build a, if you want to encapsulate your Blazor application in a progressive web app, it's really simple to do. I didn't actually prepare a demo for this uh, presentation of that because we are also already almost out of time and I still have stuff I want to talk about. But you can find good uh, templates and good demos, I believe. Chris Sainty had one and I believe Gunnar also had one, but uh, I can check that and maybe uh, add some comments. Regarding the useful links, of course, there is the official Blazor site, Blazor.net. There's the Microsoft documentation, which is awesome. And Microsoft has actually been uh, trying hard to get uh, their documentation to be awesome. There is a great GitHub repo called Awesome Blazor. If you want to start working with Blazor, if you want to try working with Blazor, Awesome Blazor is a must-go place. It is a list of, I'm going to say, 330 projects built in Blazor for different, uh, uh, different, 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 different things that you could use it. Everything from small components to complex stuff and so on. Out of the people uh, who, who often talk and blog about uh, Blazor, I like Ed here the most, even though there are others like, again, Chris Sainty or, or Dan Roth, of course, so those are the people that I suggest following. And regarding good places to find resources, there are two amazing groups. One is on Facebook, one is on LinkedIn. They are both led by the same guy, uh, Dmitry Pavlov. And uh, they are both extremely rich with ASP.NET Core uh, content. And this, of course, includes Blazor. So if anything new is happening, if any new cool resources are coming in, somebody's going to post them in those groups. So if you need uh, uh, something to waste your time with, especially during this virus crisis, please go to the, to the groups. So that's where we are now. And now the solution is, as we said, stable on server side. The Blazor client side is not yet stable. It's still new. Not all the APIs have been ported to .NET standard and so on. But so now it's a solution that you can do, use to build some sort of project, but mostly to learn. But what I would love to talk about is where they are going. So first, a step back where .NET Core is going in general. In November this year, .NET 5 is announced. Of course, uh, it's completely logical that .NET Core 3.1 will be followed by .NET 5. That's beautiful. That's something like PHP. 5. Point whatever being followed by PAP 7. 
Um, and the reason is pretty much the same because the old .NET framework that we run on your Windows had versions 4.72 or something like that, 4.81, I believe was the last one. So in order to avoid confusion between .NET 4 and .NET 4 framework, they decided, okay, we're gonna have .NET 5. .NET 5 would, would include ASP.NET Core, Entity Framework, Windows Forms, uh, WPF, Xamarin, Machine Learning.NET. It will run on all platforms and the goal is to make it uh, uh, work for everything on everything. Here you can see the, the timeline that they're planning. As I said, in November 2.20, uh, .NET 5 is going out. And actually there's a preview already uh, out, so you can try it if you are really interested. Saying that, as Microsoft wants to put .NET everywhere, it's also looking to put Blazor everywhere. So uh, they are really thinking that the components is the way to go, and they're thinking that the Blazor is the way to go, and they're gonna try to put it on all possible uh, platforms. So we already have Blazor, Blazor Server, which is in production, which allows you to build web apps that are uh, hosted on a server, handled on the server, and uh, just pre-rendered HTML is dropped in the browser. Then they also give you Blazor WebAssembly, as we said, not yet production ready, but will be soon, uh, which allows you uh, client-side execution of web apps, and uh, it can even work offline. Next we have uh, Blazor, uh, as I said, PWAs. And the good thing about PWAs is that Google Play Store actually said that they are going to start allowing at some point soon uh, uh, PWAs into the store. Uh, App Store is not yet uh, uh, open to that. As far as I know, I might be completely wrong, but uh, uh, I'm not that strong with mobile, so I might be completely wrong. The next thing they want to do is hybrid. So they want to use Blazor to get uh, uh, native.net to render not only, of course, in the browser, but also uh, to Electron, and to WebView, and so on. So that it has its own window and it basically appears like a normal application. And this is a way that a lot of applications are going today. For example, Microsoft has put out Visual Studio Code, which is, uh, uh, almost one of the most uh, used development IDEs, that's an Electron app. Slack is an Electron app. So uh, every day we are using a lot of Electron apps that we're not even aware they are Electron apps. We don't distinguish them from desktop apps, which is awesome. And of course, they wanna do Blazor native, which means they wanna build, um, they wanna use the same programming model, the same programming concept, except they want to uh, have non-HTML components. So what do I mean by that? Uh, recently, Microsoft has released something they call experimental mobile Blazor bindings. So basically, uh, they always had Xamarin, and Xamarin is a way that you can build one code base that then natively uh, compiles into native code for both mobile platforms. When I say both mobile platforms, Android and iOS. It used to compile to Windows Phone also at the time. Uh, so the idea is that the code looks the same. And as you can see the code here, the code looks pretty much uh, like it did on uh, in any component, except that the code up here is not uh, necessarily uh, classic uh, uh, markup or classic uh, Razor components, but it's Xamarin forms native UI components. And they, uh, they have released a version of this. People are blogging about it. People are trying it out in practice. Uh, the basic stuff works. It's still experimental highly, so it's not production ready. But people who have played on it, you can find cool YouTube videos and cool uh, uh, Link school blog posts, people who played with it say that for the first pre alpha initial, hey, check this out release, but it works awesome. So the attempt to actually bring Blazor to the native is 
Well, a decent attempt to say the least. So in the end, I'd just like to conclude uh, uh, discussing, is Blazor gonna take over everything? So whenever WebAssembly is mentioned, everybody asks if that is the end of JavaScript. It's not the end of JavaScript. As we saw, uh, uh, Blazor in particular, but also other WebAssembly tools don't have all the APIs exposed and they're probably never gonna have them. So JavaScript is here and it's here to stay at least for a long while. Also, uh, uh, putting Blazor on, as we've seen, for example, Blazor is not yet ready for single page applications even. So it's gonna be a while before it's ready for mobile. It's gonna be a while before it's completely ready to be hybrid for electron and everything. But some of the stuff you can already do. And uh, so Blazor isn't going to take over everything. No, not yet. And when I say not yet, I mean like not in the next five years for sure. But an important thing to, to uh, take note of is when they started the .NET framework way back, they were looking at concepts, Microsoft was looking at concepts that Java had, Microsoft was looking at ideas that PHP had. They were kind of building their own and slowly borrowing cool things from everybody else. However, Microsoft has a lot of resources, Microsoft has a lot of time, and .NET has become better and better and better and better. And then with the .NET Core, when it actually became open source, they were able to integrate the community. So it keeps becoming better and better and better and better. And whenever they see something uh, in different technology that's cool, uh, it is fairly quickly integrated into .NET Core in a similar way or with similar patterns, because the uh, goal is to, to adopt as much developers as possible. And so the .NET Core is growing kind of organically, but in a really right direction, and today it's one of the most uh, used uh, uh, platforms that there is. Blazor, they have started it about maybe over a year ago, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and recently they have started advertising it a lot. They recently had a .NET Conf just uh, dedicated to Blazor and so on. So it's still in the early versions and it's still gonna be buggy, quirky and so on. Uh, uh, it's still not production ready. It's still gonna make you pull out your hair and everything for a while. Then they're gonna release version two, then they're gonna release version three. Somewhere around version five, it could be a really great stable tool that could work across it. Of course, we are now guessing what will happen in the next five years and, and in software development and computer science, everything goes so fast and everything changes so fast and any revolutionary trick could, could make Blazor go, of course, down the drain. But looking at how much Microsoft is trying for it to be adopted and how much they are trying with advertising it and how they are uh, uh, approaching it to work with the community and with open source. Maybe it's not going to take over everything, but it could definitely come close and it could definitely be a one solution to handle a lot of stuff on a lot of platforms, a lot of devices. And I'm not going to say everywhere, but close to everywhere. Uh, so, Thanks for all of that. I'm Mario Mutzo. That was my talk. I don't have anything else more to say, but if you have any other questions, I would be most happy to answer them. Thank you, Mario. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, and this comes from a guy who um, has his uh, car, my car loan paid off by working on mobile apps only. So. Uh, I'm not much of a web developer guy, but I found it very interesting. Uh, and the whole concept of uh, holy grail of having one code base on all platforms uh, that I guess most of these big companies are trying to push. Uh, we do have a lot of questions. Um, 
I have some questions that I prepared in case nobody else asked the question, but we do have a lot of questions apart from my questions. Uh, so we're going to start with, I guess, the most um, recent one. So uh, how do I ask if uh, you think, is it worth um, investing your time now into learning the Blazor framework or is it st still too early? So in case you want to jump into the front end development, it's better to stick with Angular or React. React Native, um, what's your opinion on that? Yes and yes, <laughs> in short. So let me explain. So these days you need to know and understand JavaScript. Uh, Blazor is not gonna become so widespread quickly and JavaScript is already widespread and there's no way that people are going to get rid of it. So you need to know JavaScript, you need to understand JavaScript. Whether you need uh, to know React or Angular or anything like that, those are the classical flame wars between frameworks. Um, I prefer Angular, but I haven't really used React a lot. Uh, but basically, I would still, if you want to earn your bread and butter, uh, through coding, then you need to know, and you want to do anything, of course, with the front end, then you need to know JavaScript and one or more frameworks of your choice. If you want to learn Blazor now, it's good because if Microsoft pursues their marketing strategies, their marketing pushes and everything, and if they actually get it widespread, then by the time everybody else figures out, hey, this could be useful, you're gonna have three projects at your, three pet projects, but three projects behind your belt, and you can always say, hey, I'm an expert, I build this, this, this. So yes and yes. Uh, a very political like answer to the question. <laughs> I would say more uh, difficult because it makes you learn to start two things at the same time, but I'm a masochist that way, so. Yep. Uh, there is one question that I actually wanted to ask uh, in a, from a similar uh, manner. It, it comes from Branislav. Uh, it's actually a very um, interesting question. Is, uh, is there a significant improvement in performance-wise when using Blazor compared to React or Angular or Vue, Vue.js? Uh, or is it the same, better, worse? What's the current situation if you had uh, any chance to check this out? So, interesting question. Uh, First of all, if we are looking at uh, Blazor client side, Blazor WebAssembly, then uh, the idea is that everything gets compiled into WebAssembly. And as we said, WebAssembly is binary code that is run natively in the browser. And by measurements, WebAssembly has proven on some things to be faster than JavaScript. If you want, you can look up this research. It's easy to find when they were excited about WebAssembly, they uh, were talking all around it. On the other hand, Blazor client side needs to download and compile all of the .NET runtime into WebAssembly, which as we saw in the demo is quite slow. So from a human perspective, on most of the things, people are not gonna see a significant difference. If you're actually in computing problems to actually get a test measurement, then it's quite possible that Blazor client side will perform better because it's native client, uh, native run binaries. If you are looking at overall experience, then the application that's where WebAssembly, Blazor WebAssembly is gonna be significantly slower to load because of the significantly bigger application. So, Depending what you want, not necessarily easy comparable. Comparing to Blazor server side, I think that native JavaScript is uh, faster, but uh, the server side gives you other things that, that are beneficial, so that's why you choose that. It's not the, the, the performance is not the reason why you would choose Blazor server side. Yep, okay. Uh, one question that's actually 
I, um, because I don't really know a lot about uh, .NET ecosystem and uh, how everything works. So I did a little bit of research before today's meetup. Uh, so I can appear very smart and like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, one thing that is kind of interesting to me is uh, now the state of TypeScript because it was uh, originally developed by Microsoft as well to kind of, from my point of view, improve JavaScript. But now we have this new framework where you improve JavaScript again by not using it. You have C-sharp, which is a very serious programming language. So how is that going to affect in the long run, uh, the development of TypeScript, in your opinion, because it just seems from this perspective, if Blazor catches on to a broader community of developers, nobody would use TypeScript, maybe. So yeah, as we, as, that's a good question. But as I already said, TypeScript is now. If you look at the applications that are written now, uh, uh, a lot of JavaScript is written in TypeScript and uh, uh, TypeScript is awesome and people love it. People are using the, uh, the features it has a lot. And I think they are going to continue developing it because just it's widespread and people are using it. And even people that don't decide to go the Microsoft way uh, are using JavaScript, they're using TypeScript. So TypeScript is, again, here to stay at least for the next five, six, seven years, depending on how technology goes. Uh, will Blazor ever spread that much? Maybe yes, maybe no. Will Blazor be better than TypeScript? Will Blazor need to be uh, somehow connected to TypeScript? That's a thing that, that the future needs to show, but uh, uh, I think it's just like two different directions. So one is not going to cancel the other, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, we do have one question regarding the uh, piece of code that you wrote uh, when you uh, called the JavaScript code from the C Sharp. Uh, Aydin asks if it's uh, doable vice versa. So can you call uh, from JS uh, a C Sharp method? If you are using uh, Blazor WebAssembly, then yes. Uh, because as I said, this, this interaction between WebAssembly and uh, JavaScript, it's not tied to Blazor, it's not tied to uh, Microsoft, it's uh, uh, general. So JavaScript can call stuff from uh, WebAssembly, WebAssembly can call stuff from JavaScript, they can be uh, uh, interconnected. Okay, I uh, hope that answers your question. Uh, we do have one more question, one more on the topic of WebAssembly is, uh, it was asked during the beginning of your presentation uh, and it's, uh, Basically, the question is, can you decompile the WebAssembly? Basically, do a reverse engineering. It's more of a question, has Microsoft allowed it for the developers to see how it works? I'm gonna say, so I haven't tried it. I haven't looked into it. I'm gonna say no, or at least not to the full extent. Because if you check how how um, how low level uh, how low level WebAssembly code is, it's literally like primitive instructions that can be uh, uh, in binary code. So WebAssembly is like a state machine uh, uh, state machine with a stack. So basically, you put stuff on stack, you take stuff off of the stack. So if you want to uh, add two numbers, then you have to put two numbers from the stack. You take one from the stack, you take it into memory. You pop one from the stack, you take it to the memory. In the memory, you uh, sum them up, and then you push the result to the stack. So it is that primitive. And if you actually want to see how, uh, uh, if you want to understand that better, again, I refer you to the to Kittle's talk because he has some animations and he has some cool examples, and uh, uh, I strongly advise it. So as it is that primitive, I'm not sure if, I'm pretty sure that there doesn't exist a unique way to go from that type of a primitive set of commands to a high level uh, procedural architecture. I'm, again, I'm not sure there's like a one way street. You know, for example, if you have something like a for loop in, WebAssembly, 
it's basically always, for example, a while loop. And you never know if you want to compile it back to C sharp, you never know if you should compile it to for loop for each uh, while, I don't know, something like that, recursive procedure or anything like that. So I think not, but honestly, I have never tried and I have never uh, looked it up. Okay, so there's now a project for you to do over the weekend. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> because I don't have I don't have enough projects to do over the weekend. <laughs> well, one more, it's not gonna hurt you. Um, we do have a couple of more questions. Uh, one more question regarding the client side Blazor implementation is uh, from Damir. He asks if it works on anything else on Windows. Can you run it on Mac, for example? Uh, I haven't tried it. I think it should be. So .NET Core in general is cross-platform, so it can be hosted on Linux in Kestrel, it can be hosted on Windows in Kestrel, it can be hosted on Windows in uh, IIS, so there are different ways of making it work. So uh, I don't see a reason why any .NET Core application, and as such also the the, the Blazor WebAssembly wouldn't work on other platforms like Linux. Okay. Uh, we do have a question from Grigory. I hope I spelled that correctly. If not, I'm sorry. Um, is there a modularization of Blazor app and is there a lazy loading of the modules depending on the route, like in Angular, for example? Uh, <laughs> okay, so Again, depending what we are talking about, if we are talking about uh, server side, then then this is not the question because on server side you actually make a request on each uh, uh, each when a route changes, uh, the new HTML is pulled from the server. So that's not that's not probably what Grigori meant. Uh, regarding the client side, uh, it currently, as far as I know, there is no lazy loading, but I haven't tried it that much. As the WebAssembly is still in preview, I haven't played uh, around with it as much. I have had one uh, project that's going, that's live in, in Blazor server. I haven't played as much with uh, uh, the WebAssembly side. I think not, but I would need to check to give you an actual, an actual answer. Sorry about that. So now do you have two projects for your, uh, so you can do one on Saturday and one on Sunday. Yeah, <laughs> happy weekend. <laughs> yeah, happy weekend. Um, I hear that you're offering to babysit my kids, thank you. Yeah, we'll figure it out. No worries. I don't have any projects to do over the weekend. <laughs> I do have a shelf that I wanted to build above my TV, but we'll see about that. Uh, we had a question at the very beginning of uh, the talk uh, from Dino. Uh, he asked, if I understand correctly, what's your preference regarding the uh, logging uh, services? So he asked if you should, if your preference is with NLog or some other option. And if you're using NLog, how would you handle dependency injection? Sorry if I didn't, uh, like a very fragmented question. You know, maybe if so, you're still with us, you can just maybe rephrase it or... Yeah, no, no worries. So uh, um, basically, uh, just like any other application. So uh, um, Blazor server acts like a, it's a .NET Core application. And in, uh, in Blazor, Dependency injection works uh, normally. So if I go to code in my startup C startup in my startup, I can normally add services just like I would use I would add them anywhere else. So just like if I were building a normal .NET Core project, I can just add any service, and then wherever I want to use them, I can either inject them like this using the inject directive. I can do it in the code behind depending how you want to do it. But dependency injection works in pretty much the same way like it would in any other application. Uh, 
regarding which logger to use, I have used NLog. I have used uh, 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 NLog is, I prefer it, so I would use it. But basically, you would just inject an iLogger interface and then just use it as, uh, as you would normally. But another thing, uh, I wouldn't necessarily put logging into Blazor. I would put logging in the, in the if it's a web assembly, then I would put it definitely on the server side. And even if it's Blazor server, a good suggestion of an architecture is, uh, is that you actually have an API that the server connects to and that the server application is just uh, a front facing part of the application. That's a suggestion of an architecture. So in that case, again, the logger would go on the API side and you're solved. Okay, uh, one more question, a uh, very specific one if, my, if I can add is, again, from Vigori, he asks if there's an implementation of state management for Blazor Wasp. I was waiting <laughs> for this. I was waiting for this oh so much. State management in WebAssembly is, uh, sorry, state management for in Blazor is tricky. And going into all of it, it would take me like an hour. But what I can do is I can put some, uh, after we're done talking, I can put some uh, cool resources. Basically, WebAssembly makes some stuff pretty easy, but makes some stuff pretty difficult. So for example, keeping the state of all of the users or of all of the data is pretty easy. And that makes it great for like dashboards or, or uh, graphs or like group group uh, displays or stuff like that. Keeping a state per user is a little bit of a thing. And there are ways of doing it with mediators. There are ways of doing it. Uh, uh, but they're a pain. And uh, uh, you need to be careful about a few things. I can direct you to a few blog posts that I uh, uh, that I uh, show. But basically, what I prefer is to keep a single point of truth where all of the data is in one place, and then just uh, communicate to the end components the data that they need. And once they change it, to communicate it back and to update it at the single point of truth, in which case it gets distributed to all the components. So similar like a, a Redux story and things like that. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, either ping me later on or I'll somehow distribute the resources that I have that are gonna help a lot. Yep. Um, again, as I was, uh, as I spent most of the day yesterday reading about uh, Blazor and .NET and the entire Microsoft ecosystem, uh, and the stuff that you mentioned about uh, one ring trying to rule them all. Uh, I saw a demo from Steve Sanderson. He was he's a developer that either worked on Blazor or is a very uh, deeply involved in the entire development of the framework. He basically demonstrated how you can compile uh, Blazor, how you can basically use Blazor to build a Flutter mobile app, which I found to be very, very weird uh, combination of like two hybrid to what using one hybrid thing to build a second hybrid thing is just very, very uh, uncomprehendable for me. Uh, and also uh, you can use Blazor to render native .NET application to Electron as well. So it seems like this one thing that has uh, ability to distribute to many other platforms or even uh, change itself, morph into other hybrid platforms, it seems like maybe, are they trying too much? Do you think they're gonna get lost in all of this uh, one ring to rule them all uh, thing that they're trying to accomplish? That's a good question. So I saw that demo. Uh, however, I haven't had yet time to, to try out Flutter. So that's another weekend project for me. <laughs> and if we keep on going like this, there's not gonna be enough weekends, man. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, I don't see why not. So, I mean, it was evidently done. Uh, will they get lost? So what they wanna do is they wanna get the same concept of coding for everything and then find a way to, to uh, 
either to put it to electron or to put it like here in Flutter or whatever, um, whether they're going to get lost for going into too many directions, maybe. But from what I see, I think the Blazor team is still in an exploratory phase. They're thinking of whatever, whatever they can do and, and where they can push it. So probably through time, as they get more familiar with what can be done and what can't be done and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, they're going to cut off some directions that they were investigating and they're going to focus on some others and they're going to get a subset that uh, uh, is just enough so that it works pretty much everywhere. It can be deployed everywhere and you can keep similar coding principles, similar, uh, same code base, same tools and everything because that's, that's the final goal. Yep. Um, we had a question not strictly related to Blazor. Again, at the very beginning of the of the talk, is uh, it was a question by Hervoe, and it was actually about uh, your time in Lemax um, and how, in general, what do you feel about the company? And uh, it was a question also related to their tech stack. Are they using Angular, or they're also uh, considering using React in some of their projects? In all of their projects, can you share something? Do you have an NDA? Uh, I, even if I had an NDA, it probably expired because I was working in Lemax, in Lemax from 2009 to 20, I'm going to say 13, end of 2012. So I think, I think January, January 31st of 2013 was my last day in Lemax. So everything that I tell you is a little bit out of date, uh, but they use uh, .NET at that time, they used .NET Framework. Now they probably use .NET Core in the back end. I know that they use Angular in the front end. I'm not sure about React. I don't know enough about the tech stack to be able to actually answer that question. But from a company point of view, they're an amazing company. I worked there when they were like, I was, I think, the fifth or sixth employee. And I quit when there was about 20 of us. So hardworking, a company where hard work pays off, a company that has a vision, uh, Mate, who is the leader, is a guy that won't stop until he builds the best software uh, for tourism ever. So here's a big shout out to all my ex-colleagues and, and friends in Linux. And they are an amazing company. Uh, uh, and I'm really proud that it's possible from Croatia to build a world-class software and be among the top software vendors in their industry. So that's an amazing achievement. I don't know Mate, but shout out to Mate from Sarajevo as well. <laughs> uh, while we're in the subject of uh, figuring out should we use Angular or React in our next project, uh, I want to see your opinion about the current state of uh, web ecosystem in general, because that's like an always, uh, a thing where after a couple of beers in the pub you can start arguing with a fellow developer or something like that because new JS frameworks are popping up on github like uh, maybe it's too soon for to joke about but like COVID-19 infections so where does it stop when are we gonna say enough of the JS frameworks enough of the you know NPM modules enough of whatever all the mess that we got ourselves into right now or do you think it's a it's a very uh, how should I say, an organized chaos where it just works? <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> so probably while we were doing this meetup, uh, while we were doing this online thing, at least one more uh, JavaScript at one was more. created. Yes. So kudos to whoever created it. Give us a name. We're going to put it somewhere. Uh, so yes, there are a gazillion JavaScript frameworks. But basically, from my point of view, there are three main ones. And uh, framework is maybe uh, uh, imprecise, but you can divide it to Angular, React, Vue, and then everything else. That's my opinion. Uh, on the other hand, people are using something and then they figure out, OK, this is cool, but I would like to do it in a different way or I would like to have this uh, expanded, or I would like to cut corners here and so on. So they build their own, and then they put it on GitHub. And why shouldn't they? I mean, 
uh, if you put it on GitHub, you show, hey, I know how to do this. Hey, I had this great idea. Hey, maybe this concept helps somebody. So you can put whatever you want on uh, uh, GitHub. The important thing that I think is that people, A, understand how it works, B, understand how to use it, C, understand why and when to use it, and D, don't necessarily trust a mission critical project on a new JavaScript that uh, I put on my personal GitHub and say that's awesome because if it's used by seven people, it's probably not going to be maintained. So uh, uh, JavaScript frameworks are cool and probably a lot of them have really cool ideas, but stick to the main ones that you know that are going to be maintained is my advice. Okay. Um, if I tell you that we have uh, a viewer from Morocco, would you believe me? Uh, yeah, I also see it here in the chat. Yes. Hello, Morocco. <laughs> I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but shout out to Morocco. Um, and we also have a question from Morocco. Is um, actually quite a good question. Is can you convert the project uh, or an app written in Blazor to an exe file? Uh, not sure exactly what you mean, but when you compile or publish .NET applications, .NET Core applications, you can always get them into a DLL that you can execute with the .NET command. So uh, I'm not sure what you mean by an exe file. You mean like a console, console app? Because if you need a console app, then I mean, it's a DLL, so you can probably make an exe wrapper around it, but I haven't tried. So I don't know why I would. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that. A lot of projects for your upcoming weekend. By the way. <laughs> yep. The idea was that actually, the idea of my talk was that I kind of opened the door for you guys to, to you know, a new direction to think about, a new direction to look at, a new thing to investigate. And instead, you guys drilled me with questions so now I have to go back to the drawing board and <laughs> read more and do more demos and sleep less and so on. Luckily we are in lockdown and I can't go out or do anything else so I might actually do that. But. You know I once um, I was writing a script in Python for a, like a side of a side of a side project uh, there's like a fourth project in the pipeline um, and the guy he wanted to be able to run the script completely like uh, he didn't want to pay anything in terms of like infrastructure, but he wanted to run it on his machine. So one click and everything gets done. So uh, an exe file, you pull it from some junk somewhere, you do something with it, you convert it to a JSON, you put it somewhere else. And there's like this Java uh, software that takes the JSON and does something to it. And I managed to build, uh, and again, I'm a mobile developer. I managed to build a Python script in Windows environment and uh, wrap it up somehow in an executable file and send it to him. And the only thing he had to do was just like run two clicks, exe uh, starts, there's a console, very nice UI. This says work in progress and everything was done. Proudest moment of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Congratulations. Thank you. I had a code somewhere on GitHub. I'm not sure it still works. Um, so one more question that I wanted to ask is, um, Microsoft as a company had this weird path of, I don't know, being the world leader in developing a new operating system to having Bill Gates uh, with a pie walking to the court to having all this uh, for, I mean, we blame them for Windows Vista and the bunch of ugly fonts that they created. And now they're like this super cool company that everybody loves. Uh, they have Linux built somehow into the Windows. And um, it's just a very weird kind of, I mean, if it's a movie, it would be a very good, um, I don't know, sequel of, of uh, different kind of uh, things going on. So, um, what is your opinion currently on the entire um, community regarding the .NET uh, development and, and everything that surrounds .NET? Uh, has, what's your opinion once .NET became a fully open source uh, project? How do you feel about 
uh, being a senior developer working in .NET technologies. How do you see future? Any like maybe casual things you could say to us regarding that? So Microsoft used to be pushing you to use Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Microsoft was like, you're going to use Microsoft and that's it. And this is way back in the day. And uh, this is a similar way that Apple was pushing you to use uh, uh, Apple. Oh, they are still pushing it, believe me. <laughs> they are still pushing it, yes, but less and less. I mean, they're opening their system, more and more software is coming to, to Apple. And that's for two reasons. One, that all of the vendors want to get into Apple, and B, that Apple finally figured out that if they mean to survive, they need to play with other kids. And I think Microsoft realized the same thing a little bit sooner. So uh, first of all, they decided, they figured out, okay, there are gonna be developers. Some are gonna love Microsoft, some are gonna hate Microsoft. But we wanna get Microsoft everywhere. We wanna be able to get people who don't like Windows to use our development environment and our development languages. We wanna people who work on Mac to use our development environment and development languages. Okay, what do we do? Let's port Visual Studio to Mac. Okay, done. Let's uh, uh, get Linux into Windows so that people that prefer Linux can work. Done. Okay, let's get .NET Core so everything works everywhere. Done. Let's put it open source so that people don't think that we want to keep everything to ourselves, and, but that we are a part of the community. Okay, done. Let's build Visual Studio code that's not necessarily used for Microsoft technology, but can be used for pretty much any technology. Done. Let's open source. So they are. Uh, uh, targeting more and more people and they're opening windows up to more and more people they're opening uh, uh, visual studio up visual studio code they are trying to get as much developer involved and the developers are reacting really positively so if you check a number of plugins that have been written for like visual studio code it's insane if you uh, uh, check what's been what uh, extensions have been written for visual studio it's amazing so uh, if you check i believe they have a somewhere in one presentation I saw like a community of 60,000 developers that are uh, continually contributing to, to ASP.NET Core. That's like, that's amazing. That's really a, a great achievement on its own. And it, they're starting finally to listen to what the community is telling them and where to move their products further instead of deciding on their own. And I think that in the past few years, the hype about Microsoft is uh, awesome. I don't know when they bought, github and now that they are getting npm people were again a bit skeptic but i'm not sure that that's necessarily a bad thing i think they can uh with this new mindset i think they can do wonders for those platforms as well so uh i look at it from a positive side of view i think that they have moved the development community in general and especially the development community and microsoft technologies forward yeah, I read an interesting article about uh, the acquisition of GitHub. Uh, some blogger, YouTuber, whatever, he was analyzing the business model of GitHub and he basically said uh, when it was cool to say that Microsoft is going to ruin GitHub, he said it's basically the best thing that could have happened to GitHub because Microsoft was not buying GitHub uh, to make profit out of the company. So now GitHub doesn't have pressure towards the final investor to basically implement features that are going to be money driven, but they're going to be developer driven. So you're going to get feature that doesn't necessarily make more money for GitHub, but makes your life easier so they can still keep their uh, membership prices up to a reasonable level. So in the long term, he anticipated that GitHub would actually benefit from being acquired by Microsoft. And from this point, I guess, how long has it been? More than a year, year and a half, two years. Uh, they're doing fine, and I don't see any anything wrong with GitHub. Yeah, in fact, it's quite good. Even yeah, better. I pretty much I pretty much agree with it. The only thing that Microsoft managed to ruin and ruin colossally is Skype. When Skype was working, it was working beautifully, quickly, uh, it was fast, and everything. Then, when Microsoft took it over, there are new versions and new versions and new versions and the smile icons are animated and they're pretty and you get a lot of GIFs, but the conversation doesn't work anymore, the loading is slow, finding contact is horrible, uh, and so on and so on. So that's a cool example of how to ruin a perfectly good product and how to drive your 
customers away to Slacks or other tools. Yep. Um, it seems that we don't have any more questions. And uh, we no were... more weekend projects. <laughs> weekend projects, <laughs> only three. Uh, it's a decent number. If you like plan your time quite nicely, you it's, it's doable. Um, it, we've been actually talking for more than one and a half hour. So um, it's, it's been actually quite a successful meetup, if I can say. Uh, we had a very engaged community, which I think is, is a tremendous achievement considering this is basically, I th well, for me at least, the first time I've been doing anything uh, similar. Actually, this is the first time I've used Zoom in all my life. I've never used Zoom before. Um, so for all of you who attended the, the meetup or, or webinar, how should we call it? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I should point out that uh, even though this has been kind of broadcasted to, to kind of uh, the entire region, all of you get, uh, that's basically the, the one other thing that all the attendees of Test House Meetups, you get a free three-day pass for our co-working space. Uh, because it's a coronavirus issue now, we're not sure when we're going to be using it, but you should know because you attended the meetup, you have a three-day uh, pass for our co-working. If you're from Sarajevo, feel free to stop by. If you're not from Sarajevo, but you plan to come at certain uh, point, you you can basically count on it. Uh, it's a very cool co-working space. Uh, maybe I'm a bit subjective, but I think we are we have the best community in the country. Uh, so it's a very cool environment for you to hang around if you're if you plan on working. Again, uh, thank you, uh, Mario, for uh, having this awesome talk about uh, Blazor and the entire uh, ecosystem of where, uh, of where hybrid apps and front-end apps and back-end everything is kind of like now uh, colliding into one transformer. We'll see where it's going to lead us in, in a couple of years. And um, I guess if there's no more questions, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, this presentation, oh, I have to share the uh, link from the presentation which I'm gonna do right now. So it's gonna basically be hosted on our um, G drive so you can always access it. Get shareable link. So here's the presentation link in the chat. Uh, this talk is also gonna be on our YouTube channel. Um, if you maybe joined at, at the very end or you left at the very beginning, so but you wouldn't know that it's going to be hosted on YouTube. But anyway, <laughs> we're going to host it on our YouTube channel so you can uh, go through it again. Um, and yeah, that's basically it from my side. If you have anything to add, Mario. Uh, no, I'd just like to thank uh, everybody who was listening. I would like to thank the 17 persistent people who managed to survive an hour and 40 minutes. Congratulations. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to talking to you again. Maybe next time, we can do a talk about state management in, in <laughs> Blazor apps for Gregorio, <laughs> but for everybody else. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Okay. Looking forward to meeting you all in Sarajevo at some point. Hopefully. Yeah, we're going to have a Chevap party when this is all over. <laughs> oh, yes. Looking forward to that. <clears throat> Ciao. Thanks. Bye.